Welcome. I'm Professor Parker in the English department. Um, and before we start, before I introduce Austin English, I'd like to first offer a lot of thank yous because this has been a huge undertaking. Um, and I'd like to thank, first of all, our funding co-sponsors for this week's residency. And they are DACE, the Art and English Departments, Humanities, Digital Studies, and the Dean's Office. Um, second, I really need to thank uh, the staff and faculty and students who have been supportive, who've worked so hard to make the residency a, a success. It has been a success. And, and particularly, Kathy Barton, uh, Meredith Mama, Mary Beth Monaco Vavrick, who is the work study student in English, um, Randy Ingram, Joel Dietrich, Tyler Starr, all of whom have co-hosted uh, Austin in classes, welcomed him, had, had dined with him, made him feel better. You feel better? Yeah. Better. A lot better. Um, and it took everyone, really all of these people, took everyone's hard work to make this residency happen. Uh, and it's been a week, it's been a week that's included for Austin English visiting five courses, um, giving this the second of two public talks, um, having 19 lunches in five days, 79 dinners, and 1.2 million cups of coffee. I would like to thank dining services and all the restaurants whose money now is theirs and not Davidson's. Also, I would like to, um, I have some flyers for the College Writing Awards. Uh, the deadline for these awards is Monday. And what, I, what I've done is just printed out a bunch. It's got a QR code. You might want to take a picture of this and I'll explain a little bit about the awards. So this, this is a kind of no-brainer for those of you who've ever gotten an A. It's like that simple. Take your paper, upload it, and win the award. Like nobody calls you, I'm in charge of it, I won't do this. Nobody calls you and says you lost. It's not, you, you can only win or not win. You can apply also in two categories. You can apply in scholarship and you can apply in creative writing. In creative writing, you have to choose which of the three genres. So poetry, fiction, nonfiction. Um, but we're also welcoming this year for the first time translations, uh, so long as you acknowledge the original author of the piece. Seems a good thing to do given an honor code, say. Um, again, deadline is Monday. If you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards. I'm happy to answer those questions for you. And again, the QR code will link you to the Google Doc. Very easy to upload your work. So please do so if you're interested. The one caveat I would give you by way of the awards is that we do ask if you've submitted work that you be available the night of April 13th, which is the contest announcement. We want you to be there in person. And if that can't happen, uh, I take small unmarked bills. I am happy to negotiate this with you. Um, finally, also books are available for sale. Austin's books are here. He'd be happy to sign. We're gonna have a Q&A after tonight's talk and I hope, uh, I hope you dig in. So um, he, he has been able to answer questions. It's a good thing. You might have noticed that in those Two long early remarks, I exaggerated the food and drink portion of Austin English's experience here at Davidson. I did so to offer a premise in the form of a statement in the form of an exaggeration. What if I wanted to make a graphic novel or even just a comic out of a visit by a cartoonist to a college where there's only food? where all he does for a week is eat. Here's what I'm thinking in this comic that I'm gonna design and execute. We'll use colors to indicate the inside world and the outside world. We'll shift colors for anatomical matters. Bodies will be in different colors. We'll use lighter and heavier lines and line weights for before and after yet another meal. When he's full, there'll be a heavier line. 
will have forms pressing into their frames from the inside out, and a sociological subtext about conspicuous consumption, food waste, food miles, GMO poisoning, and the evils of capitalism. All of this sounds like it's doable in a comic, and to my mind, boring, really boring. Because, as Austin has taught us all week, I did something egregious, really bad, which is I started with the ideas and not with the drawing. So I'm gonna take a different approach, one which I hope honors even more fully and in fulsome ways our distinguished guest, Austin English, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a little travelogue that I have prepared of his visit to Davidson this week. Here's Austin English arriving at Davidson. Here he is on the lawn in front of Chambers. I think he's happy. Here he is, also on the lawn at Chambers, further away. He's thinking. He's always looking at people dead on like that. Here he is sleeping. Here he is worrying. Here he is as a redhead. Not his dream. Here he is having a really big idea. And here's Austin English after giving his talk tonight. Austin English was born in 1983 in San Francisco. He's an artist and writer living in Brooklyn. As a cartoonist, he has published the books Gulag Casual and Meskin and Umezo. His artwork has been exhibited in galleries throughout the United States, including Marvin Gardens in New York and Et Al Gal Gallery in San Francisco. His art has been written about in publications, including Art in America, Bomb Magazine, and the Huffington Post, among others. He runs the comics publishing house Domino Books, the distro, which he founded in 2011. He teaches comics and drawing at the Parsons School of Design and art history, the history of comics, at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. He also serves as the managing editor of the Comics Journal. He's been with us all week, and he's gonna talk now. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Well, I want to, um, can you guys hear me okay? I, I also have to say some thank yous to start off. I really, um, this has been a, a really amazing week. I, I can't. I can't say that enough. I've, I've been saying it over and over again, but it's, it remains true. I really have to thank everyone here at Davidson who, who made this happen. It has been uh, not only seamless, but just a true pleasure. I really have to thank Al Michael Parker for, um, for making this happen. Um, and and I really, um, I'd really like to thank the students that I've been able to um, um, sit in on so many classes with and. And um, you know, it, it's such an intimate thing making creative work or, or expressing yourself in a class. And I felt very nervous about sitting down with you guys in each one of your classes because 
it's such a, you know, I, I come in to, to, to your spaces and, and make some comments about what you're doing. And, you know, it's, it's a special thing that you're doing. So I really appreciate the, the trust of, of, of letting me do this with you guys. And I, I really, really loved it. So it's very bittersweet. This has been a very fun um, week of, uh, of events. And it's, to me, it's very bittersweet that it's uh, ending uh, with, with this talk. But I won't, I won't dwell on that too much. Um, so I want to start off. Um, by talking to you guys about work, I've, you know, my interest in, in making comics and, you know, some of my beliefs around them and some of what, as, as not just a maker of comics, but a reader, what's drawn me to the medium and, and what I view as some of its potentials and, and what I try, a little bit of what I try to accomplish um, with this art form um, or what I'm constantly trying to accomplish with it. I, um, you know, a lot of cartoonists have said this thing um, that I would hear over and over again, and it, it seemed very true to me, um, and it remains true, and I, I feel like now I have more of an ability to articulate um, uh, the meaning of this, but um, this, this idea of comics as an intimate art form, you know, I, I would hear that a lot, and it always seemed very true, and I think um, it's, it's my interest in the medium that it's an intimate art form, and I think a way to describe that is if you're working as a novelist um, and you're, you're writing um, in private, you, you put a book out and someone reads that book in private, there is a deep intimacy to that, right? It's kind of a one-to-one -one connection. But it will be filtered through you know, symbols of, of letters and poetry can kind of get around that and, and sequence the letters in a, in a way that breaks away from them being this in inherited language. But comics has always been something that I've never been able to get over with them that's always fascinated me, is that they are, if when you're writing, you write someone sat down in a chair, with cartooning, you, someone draws someone sitting down in a chair in their own way. And so you have this complete personal way of communicating, not just thoughts and ideas, but of just the pure language to communicate thoughts and ideas. And I have never, um, I've never gotten over how important receiving work in that way has been to me. It's been a, um, um, beyond a comfort, just, just something that receiving someone's expression in that way has been um, a, a huge, it's been a huge thing in my life. Um, so I, I also, early on, some of the, the earliest experiences I had was, with art was seeing work that was made with this unity of making images and, and, and with uh, writing as well. And I, I have this like powerful memory of seeing um, this facsimile of Lewis Carroll's original manuscript for um, Alice's Adventures Underground, Alice in Wonderland, and it's his drawings, you know, the Tennille illustrations that are, you know, kind of these beyond iconic illustrations are, are you know, I, I would see those too, but the original, this original manuscript, I remember it being read to me very early on, and the idea of someone creating these imaginative worlds with their own imagery and seeing, you know, I couldn't read the text, it had to be read to me, but realizing that someone had made this by hand and it was such a deeply imaginative vision, I think that, that um, the potential for that stuck with me forever, just creating this, um, this complete world of feeling and, and thought by hand. I, I don't think I ever was able to, to, to forget that. Um, I was also very lucky early on to see work by, um, when I was maybe um, pre-adolescent, um, there was a reproduction in, in the house I grew up of some of Charlotte Solomon's work. And Charlotte Solomon was um, you know, a painter living in Berlin. She uh, came of age um, you know, um, during World War II, very turbulent, turbulent circumstances. She was sent to um, concentration camps. She was dismissed through a clerical error. Um, two years later, she was sent back to the camps and, and lost her life. In that two-year period, she made this incredible um, uh, 500 painting narrative. And it doesn't really comment on the, the politics that were happening at the time. Um, it's really about her grandparents, her parents, and then specifically it goes into this um, mentor that her, her stepmother had, um, a vocal theorist. And a lot of the book is devoted to recording his theories, but it's explicitly narrative. And I remember, you know, at this point I was aware of very commercial comics and loved them. I would, of course, I was reading and, uh, you know, um, obsessed with things like X-Men and Spider-Man and all those things. Um, but seeing work like this um, suggested to me like a confirmation of the potential I had always felt with this medium that instead of reducing the expressive nature of comics, you could, you could amplify it. You could 
you could make a work of narrative art without resorting to caricature or resorting to reducing um, the, the, the deep emotion that you wanted to express. And I'm fascinated by this work by Solomon in that she begins doing it, you know, the first half of the book, she'll have, um, she, she would put wax paper. I mean, she wasn't, these weren't being displayed publicly. She was just making them in this, you know, very um, high pressure two years. Um, but she would put wax paper over the early images and there'd be notation and there'd be, um, you know, dialogue. And you were supposed to, you were instructed to lift the wax paper up and then see scenes like this. Um, but then as she went on, kind of working in a vacuum, she, you know, she wasn't aware of whatever was happening in, in uh, sequential art at this time. But she would start, she stopped using the wax paper and started putting text directly on her paintings. And I was, I was fascinated by when doing this, they, they might be less layered images than this, but when doing this, she doesn't reduce the, the beauty and, and emotional power of her images. It still retains and the expression of these characters and the way they pose. But she has, there is some of the traditional elements of comics that, that, um, that she begins using, just putting the text on the page and, and, um, and uh, focusing more on just speech rather than scenes. Um, but I, I never forgot, um, I never forgot this book. And so, you know, experiences like that and, and um, um, many other examples of just visual art or, or writing in general, but especially visual art paired with writing, it was, you know, I, I, um, I think like anyone, um, you know, communicating with um, people in real life was always, um, there, there were always, it was always hard to communicate deep, um, deep concerns and deep things in, in normal conversation. And as I became a teenager, there was this so much, there was so much obstruction just to, um, to, to, try to, to try to express oneself. And I always deeply valued all the, um, all the experiences I had with people's art because the, the, the amount of correspondence I could have with someone in their creative work was so important to me. And the physical act of drawing was also deeply um, I, re I remember the first time sitting down to focus on drawing, and I remember being more focused and engaged than I'd been um, probably at, at, you know, it was just an incredibly memorable experience. But I knew that the drawings that I made when I would share them with peers and I would share them with teachers, um, I, I had a hard, you know, I, the response was never um, completely cruel or negative, but it, there was, I, I did get a sense that drawing was not something I was necessarily supposed to do. I remember working on this drawing of my brother in high school for a drawing elective and just being so engaged in it, but I did, you know, I, I barely passed this class. I think I got a C minus minus. I don't remember how they made that an official grade. But, um, so I did start to, for whatever reason, I did become very self-conscious about drawing and maybe more about sharing my art with other people, having it be known that I was interested in making art and that I, that I was ambitious about making art. I felt very self-conscious about that. So I thought, well, maybe if making comics is important to me, maybe I'll just write them. You know, there's, there's cartoonists um, who, who do both things, but there's also people who are writers who write with other artists, and I like their work. But then, as a teenager, I would discover people like Daniel Klaus and his work you know, reminded me of, you know, the experiences I had with, with work like Charlotte Solomon's, that the, the best visual narrative art in comics is done by one person, someone who's writing and drawing. And so I remember when I discovered Daniel Klaus's work, I was like, well, I, I, can't, I can't get out of this duty to tell stories just by writing. I, I do have to figure out a way to, I have to figure out a way to be comfortable with presenting my drawings to people. This is how I want to communicate. And, you know, part of the conundrum was Daniel Klaus's work was, you know, I look at it now and it just feels like magic to me. I, I can never draw that way. And, um, you know, I have friends who make art in a similar way to me and sometimes they'll look at work like Klaus's and they'll say, oh, it's too illustrative, it's, it's too controlled, that's not, you know, that's not expression to me. But I have such a respect for, for art like this because I can tell how, I mean, I, I know from my own struggles of making art how hard it is to work this way. It feels like magic to me to look at work like this. So I, I have a, a deep, deep respect for it. But I was very lucky to quickly discover other artists um, who made visual comics, uh, who, who made visual art with, with, with narrative like Julie Doucet. Um, and Doucet's work, you know, it's, I um, 
am thankfully, I, I know enough about art that to me, Doucet's expression is, is uh, not just on par with Klaus, but you know, um, it, it, they're both on the top of different, very different mountains. But when I would look at Doucet, this seemed approachable to me. I knew that there, there was a window here that I could, you know, I, I, I knew that there was an avenue here to approaching, making, um, drawing comics in my own way and telling a story with drawings in my own way. Her work instantly communicated that to me. I wasn't there yet, but I, I knew that there was, a, there was a way in by looking at this kind of art. I was lucky to find work by people like Mark Beyer. Um, uh, and the fact that Mark Beyer's work was, was beloved and that people, th th that gave a certain sense of permission that, that work like this that I immediately connected with, but I would assume other people would just laugh at. There was this, there was this love for what Mark Beyer did. And if you take nothing away from this talk, I would, I would look up some Amy and Jordan strips by Mark Beyer, because they're, they're amazing. Um, and another key thing was, um, I had started really getting into the idea of people who self-publish their work. Um, I was, you know, there'd be around 1998, I was getting these uh, catalogs that would talk about zines. They'd be full of reviews of, of, of like hundreds and hundreds of different zines and they'd have little capsule reviews that would say like, oh, if you're interested in like how to repair bikes in Massachusetts, send $3 to this PO box and you would put $3 in an envelope and you would get someone's, you know, written expression back in the mail. And oftentimes you would get people's art back in the mail. Uh, John Porcelino was one of these people. This is the first issue uh, that he did at 60 cents. Uh, that was about 30 years ago. This last month, this is issue 82, it's up to $5. But he has been self-publishing this work about his own life, about his friends, and he's been putting these in the mail forever, for the last 30 years. And this example of, of making work in this way, that was the key thing, where now I, could, now I could work passionately on work like this, and I could do it not in private, it would be public with other artists and, and people who I was interested in. I could send the, the people who I was getting zines from and, and corresponding with, I could send this work to them, but it wouldn't be public in my day-to-day -day life. That was, that was a big, big thing. And so I did this when I was uh, 16. This is the first scene I did. And I've kind of never, um, I've never stopped being involved in, in self-publishing and, um, and distributing my artwork. And many, I have a, a small um, company where I distribute people's self-published work. And I've, I, since this moment in time, I've never stopped being involved in, in this kind of expression. It's very, very important to me. And so throughout high school and college, I continued making work. And um, I started to think, you know, I, I could tell that the, the work I was making, even communicating with people outside of my own personal life, I could tell that there was, the, that, that my work was in some ways confusing to people or strange or needed more explanation. And I, I was conscious of that, and I, but I started to develop this feeling about my own real experiences with work. I, was, I hoped that this idea I was developing wasn't justifying being lazy or um, not taking proper care with my art. But it did, the idea did resonate with me about my real experiences with art, that art isn't necessarily about communication. You know, I would think like, is my work communicating? Are people, are people getting communication from my work? I think they're getting, they're, it's not communicating exactly. But I tend to think of art that I've experienced that has meant something to me more as interaction than communication. You know, if I'm sitting down, at this time, if I was sitting down to make work, and I was thinking ABC, I'm trying to communicate the idea ABC. Well, through my hand, it would come out XYZ, uh, you know, at best. Uh, but the people experiencing it, I don't know if they're gonna get ABC or XYZ, they're probably gonna get like P4 or something like that. Um, but that, you know, I, when I would think about that, I'd, I'd, sometimes I'd be like, yeah, they're getting P4 from my work, that's not very good. But then I remembered, you know, like with, with, with all my, most memorable experience with, with art, that's, that's what I would get, you know? And that, that, that carried me through a lot, of, a lot of the early work I made. Um, then over time, I got, I, I think around the work that's, this is, um, I'm gonna show some work from my book, Gulag Casual, uh, which collects, which was a suite of, of um, five collected stories. And around this time, I really got, I, I felt, much more, um, much more of a drive for making comics. It took me, at this point I'd been making comics for around a decade and I felt like this was the beginning of, it, 
coming to figure out what I was doing or, or, or feeling much more engaged with it. And I had realized that the biggest obstruction for me with working with comics was this very dominant idea of cartoon integrity, which is kind of, you know, within cartooning, it's this idea that little Lulu in panel one, page one, she looks this way on, the, on page 22, the last panel, she looks the same way. Anytime you look at little Lulu on the page, you're gonna recognize little Lulu. And I, you know, John Stanley and Irving Tripp's Little Lulu, it's one of my favorite comics, I love it. Um, but I don't, you know, that, uh, there's a lot of comics that obey those rules. And for me to sit down and make drawings with that kind of cartoon integrity idea in mind was just deadening to me. I couldn't, um, I couldn't bring myself to work in that way. And I had a lot of, I had a lot of conflicts about that, but I did, at some point I let myself um, decide that I didn't need to do that and that I could make these drawings with characters and, um, and create my own logic for them. You know, I wanted the stories to communicate and I felt that there was enough information on the page for that to happen. Um, but I, I, I felt that I could, um, I felt that I could abandon that, that idea of cartoon integrity and still, still tell a story that was, was affecting to people or, or that simply told a story. And, you know, I, I was also kind of aware that making work like this within cartooning was, to most people, they'd pick it up. You know, I worked in comic book stores, so I knew that when people picked up work like this, they'd be like, oh, it's just, you know, experimental uh, comics. You know, I guess that's fine that this exists, but this isn't for me. But I always felt something about experimental art that, I think the kind of experimental art that I don't connect with is experimental art that's done with the, with the um, upfront desire to experiment. And I would always have to confess when I would talk to people about my work that my desire was often to make a normal story. Maybe for the first couple of panels, I would want to draw, you know, I'd be like, okay, this is gonna be the one where, you know, this is gonna be like an episode of Battlestar Galactica or something, it's all gonna make sense. Um, but then like a couple of panels in, it would kind of, you know, it would fall apart. That, that desire for that would fall apart. And I think um, I was grateful for the ability to, instead of giving up and starting again, which is maybe what a more, a certain kind of disciplined artist would do, I was um, very excited to kind of ride the disintegration and see where that brought me. And then, you know, pull back. A lot of my work is about improvising and then editing the improvisation. So I would, you know, I would ride into what was happening and then I would try to pull the reins back and try to recover control and then, you know, go back and then things would fall apart again and kind of just constantly going over the, um, the pile of pages that would add up into the story and, and try to find some kind of balance between the two, um, the two ends of the spectrum. Um, a lot of times, you know, a phrase or, or an association with a person, um, thoughts about a friend would be what would, um, what would be the main uh, impulse to tell a story? Um, my, um, you know, uh, just, just a general feeling about someone and a desire to paint kind of a portrait about my feeling of them. Um, or just, you know, a string, I would always have notes about what would happen in a scene and I would try to work with those notes um, and go through and tell a story in that way. But then that was always, um, working in conjunction with uh, a desire to improvise in the drawing. And I was constantly trying to find a way for the two things to meet. Um, and I think through the work in, in Goulash, Goulash Casual, I think I, I did come, I, I, I figured out a way for them to meet in, I, I think, a very organic way. Or I, that's what I was working towards. Um, and I was very, um, it was very important to me while working on this period of stories to work in many, with many different mediums in many different ways. And to try to find, um, I do think stability is important in making art. I do, I, I, I want to try a lot of different things, but I was looking for some stability, you know, um, some kind of grounding um, system for making work. And I came to, this was, this story, a New York story was the new story. Um, in this, uh, in this collection, the other stories were in anthologies. This was the one that was new for the book. And I finally came up with this system of allowing myself to sit down and, and do a pencil drawing um, and to give myself 
as much freedom, because that's the pleasurable part for me. Drawing in pencil is the pleasurable part, the part I really, really enjoy. Um, and so to give myself as much freedom in doing that as possible and to come up with a pencil drawing that had a real structure and had a real, um, that worked in whatever way that I thought a pencil drawing should work and then come in and start inking. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not the most skilled inker in the world. I like the way I ink, but um, you know, ink would drip and there'd be a million mistakes that would happen. And as long as the structure of the drawing was strong, I think it could withstand those mistakes and the mistakes could, um, could add to whatever the beauty of the drawing was going to become. Sometimes the problems with ink would become so great, or this actually happens um, with students I teach where they'll, they'll like do a pencil drawing that is just like the most sensitive, you know, like beautiful fantasy art pencil drawing. It's like a lush uh, vision and it'll, it'll be like this soft pencil drawing and then they'll come in and ink it and they'll do it very competently but the, the feeling is totally lost. That happens, um, but that, that happens with me a lot and sometimes you know it's either the mistakes or, or just the inking deadens the drawing so much that then that's when I start working with collage as another form of editing. Maybe the, um, sometimes I would refer to the work as like pragmatic surrealism because I, I believe you know, a lot of people talk about surrealism as being weird or like, oh, it's all based in dreams. And yeah, that's part of it. But there is this, there is this, this belief in the improvisation that I think gets downplayed with surrealism. And then so I love to improvise and then I love to edit. So that's where the pragmatic part comes in. Um, and usually when I work with collage, there's a lot of collage in this image. Um, I would always love the results. But so sometimes I would think, well, maybe I'll, um, Maybe I'll just do a weak pencil drawing and ink very quickly and then just start collaging because that'll, you know, that'll make it work. But that way of kind of disingenuously bringing in collage would never work. It had to be, it had to, it had to need to be collaged for, for me to want to work with it. Um, and I really, um, I had been working just in graphite and I, it, it was, that was maybe the most pleasurable, pleasurable way to work, but I, I started to feel that, um, Graphite was just lacking a certain contrast. So I, I really, the introduction of ink really helped that. I tried to, after the stories in Gula Casual, I tried to um, go back to graphite and just work in graphite. Um, but I felt that I was just bearing down too much and it, it felt like a step backwards. So for this project, um, Mescan and Amezzo, um, I, I committed back to working with graphite. Um, uh, inking and, and colored pencil with, with um, and then, then painting everything with, uh, or going over everything with a brush and water and, and blotting everything out to, to flatten out the color. Um, this project, Mescan and Nemezo, I, I feel that um, I'm very proud of. And I think the ideas that have appeared in my work, you know, I, I, um, the art that's affected me the most and the art that I strive to make is, it's, what it's about is not so complicated. At, at heart, it's about just how people interact with each other. Um, you know, I think that's, that seems very general, but I, I do think it is something that art can tend to ignore sometimes. But the art that's meant something to me is, is involved with how people interact with each other. And um, I feel that in this work, I, I got close to expressing, getting, got closer to being able to tame the materials to a degree that I could, I could make a more coherent, but hopefully not deadening statement about how people interact. Um, it took me, the, the basis of the story is just two people talking to each other. Um, it's, it's a long conversation that lasts for about 74 pages. And I had notes about what I wanted these characters to talk about. Um, I, I had things that, that seemed worthwhile for them to hit on. Um, but it's, it, as I started drawing, I didn't draw it with a script. I didn't do any thumbnails. I just started sitting down and drawing it. And when I got about 20 pages in, I felt that, okay, well, finally they're, finally they're saying something that means something to me. And I think they can continue discussing this. Um, maybe around here, actually. And so I kept going for another 10 pages to kind of ride the um, momentum of them finally getting to something that, that I feel was was important, and then I went back and redrew the first 20 pages, and then the process that I've talked about before of constantly a, a, a back and forth of editing, 
and um, improvising with the drawings began anew. So I, I, I think that first 20 page section I might have kept editing over and over again, uh, more times, maybe three or four times, but the editing of the first 20 pages initially took a year and a half, and then um, all in all the book took about four years to do. Um, but I don't, I don't think of that time, the editing portion of it as wasted time in any way. I mean, it's, to me, that was the writing of it. Figuring out how to draw these characters, figuring out how I felt about drawing them. And then, you know, maybe one of the most truly intimate things about cartooning is uh, watching people's, I mean, this is, this is, um, amazed me my entire life, sitting down and reading someone's uh, like a stack of people's 20 page comics or maybe a, a collection of people's work and as the years pass by as you're reading something you, you see someone's drawing change. Some cartoonists go back and um, not for purposes of the theme, they go back and um, edit all their drawings so that they're, they're, they all sync up with where they're at with drawing at that moment. But I, I love watching people's drawing change through a project and um, I, um, the, the editing I did was to not extinguish, to, to, to not like get rid of an earlier way of drawing. Um, it was really more to change the expression of things, uh, the expression of what was being said. Um, but I do feel that there are, well there's hopefully some coherent whole of, of how these images look. I do feel there's a, there's a wide swath of four years. It took four years to do and hopefully there are, um, hopefully there's, there's some kind of journey that you can have beyond what's said and, and beyond what's expressed. There might be some feeling communicated by, by watching someone draw for four years. I know that that's always been something, it's, it's hard to describe. It's hard to describe the process of watching people's drawings change, but I've always appreciated it. Um, I am going to show some work that I've just began working on um, I, the, 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 the Mexican and Mezzo project took quite some time, um, and I have kind of gingerly been starting a new project. And um, what the, the main thing that I switched was I had been using colored pencils and, and, and adding water to them to flatten things out. But at some point, um, I, you know, I would see people, uh, my partner works with markers, and I would walk into her studio, and um, I would see these amazingly uh, vibrant colors that she was working with, and I thought, oh, well, I'm really, I mean, what, why, am I, why am I going through this counterintuitive method of using colored pencils? I, I should really start using markers, and that'll create the flat color that I'm really looking for. And it's just, it's been exciting changing the materials just a little bit. That's been a, that's been a very valuable um, uh, motivator to, to start working on this new project. So I've just gingerly started um, but there, these are the first three images of it. So now, um, this is the part I'm most excited for. I'm going to read a section from Meskin and Amezzo for you. I don't get to read my comics that much, but um, I'm gonna get to do so right now. So let me, I'm gonna look at the screen, so let me know if you can still hear me as I do this. So this scene takes place, it starts off in a bookstore. This is the person working in the bookstore. Um, this is the bookstore attendant. Uh, it's a multilingual bookstore. Um, and this character is named Ramona, and the, the way this story works, there's two main characters, Mescan and Amezzo, they're having this conversation. Ramona, maybe she knows them, maybe she doesn't know them, maybe she's their friend, maybe she's a friend from the past, who knows, it doesn't really matter, but she's very, very interested that these two characters talking speak to each other. She's just inter interested that they maintain some kind of relationship, that they, that they correspond in some way. Um, and she starts to explain here a little bit what, what she means by that. So she says, culture has lost all coherence. This does not require notice. If I go here, can you guys still hear me? If I'm talking here, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna start again. Culture has lost all coherence. Better over here? Okay. Let me just move my notebook here. Culture has lost all coherence. This does not require notice. These boys are naive. They do note it, and they do react. This moves me. I like people who care about things. I don't care about myself. In my younger days, I had my moments. I wanted things. I felt strongly. 
I was animated in relation to my interaction with those I held dear. This way of life, of course, never amounted to much. I reacted violently. This violence was inflicted internally, very much by design. But over time, it began to seep out into the lives of others, perceptible to all. I'm not stupid. I knew the cliche of this emotion was beneath me. Now I withdraw from all that. What's left is a vaguely defined, though sincere, concern for these two, generated from a ludicrously safe distance. And then our two main characters pass by them. Uh, it's not important if they see each other or not, but they are passing by. Uh, Amezo, speaking to Meskin, says, now, maybe the feeling I have for you begins here. With your hatred of false catalogs, that's Meskin talking. Um, maybe we've spoken to each other like this every week, constantly, endlessly. And it's always the same, always undeniable and plain how you are. I'm not, if I'm forced to say it, without a small, indefinable grain of tenderness for feeble sincerity. But that's as far as I'll go. Excuse the clutter, and they go into Emezo's apartment. Welcome. If only you just, I know what I'm trying to say, I just, I know that I care about speaking to you. And, uh, Mezzo laughs, I'm not good at doing uh, laughter. Um, I don't understand what's so funny about the things I say. I'm a figure of fun. It takes all of my heart and mind to say whatever it is I say to you. But honestly, what does it matter? Wax in your ears again, what does it know? I don't mean to negate you over and over. Some mutual acknowledgement, any even, is something. Yes, I see the beauty in that, sure, yes, I do. But I simply see it, nothing more. There's nothing here, really. And this is Ramona observing the scene from afar, and this is her, her speaking in caption. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Am I heartbroken? I can't say that I disagree. There is, if not nothing, very little beyond my tepid faith in them. Without these two, what do I have? The drab world. What I spend every moment trying to avoid and which never fails to assert itself with merciless authority. It can be as simple as an arrangement of things, a configuration of buildings, the very sight of it. Overwhelmed is the wrong word. The absolute dread of having no correspondence with the world not to imply that any such correspondence is deserved or of any value to begin with. Thank you so much. Someone be so kind as to hand that mic around as well. Questions, anybody? Happy to do this Q and A. Yeah, this is the easy part. Hi. 
Hi. <clears throat> um, sorry. Uh, do you think Ramona's soliloquy, or I'm not exactly sure what it might be classified as, but at the beginning came from a place of like personal experience from you, or do you think that that was more an expression of you trying to articulate how people try and justify like their earlier lives or their younger lives? Do you lives? mean the, the earlier part where she's talking about, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I always, I, I kind of resist like interpretations that are, oh, this is someone expressing themselves through their characters or not. I mean, but of course some of it is, some of it definitely syncs, syncs up with thoughts I've had or thoughts I do have. It really is, I mean, I, I think most of, um, uh, most of what characters say and, and, and what they're expressing has something to do with me and something to do with people that I value or, and, or people that I've talked to and expressions that, I think in a New York story, a lot of it is, uh, you know, a friend of mine who passed away, a lot of it are stories that people are telling, like, about that person, but it never addresses that exactly, and it's not really about that person passing away, but the when they were expressing those stories, they were meaningful to me, and I wanted to preserve them in some way, but not just to preserve them, they were, you know, they're, they were affecting uh, in what they expressed, and I think, so there's always a combination of, of things I've, things that have been communicated to me and some of me, and hopefully a good combination of those two things. But it's hard for me to separate it, you know? Um, but I definitely, I definitely sync up with some of these things for sure. I wonder if you could. Hello. Hey. Hey, I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about the distinction between cartoon integrity and stability, right? I get cartoon that's good, integrity that's really a good clearly, question. right? But I wonder how do you define stability as a framework or a parameter with a particular range when you set out to, well, yeah, when you, when you work for I, stuff. I think a lot of it is like with that idea of like wanting to communicate with picture stories and the idea of cartoon integrity being so dominant, at least in that period, finding justification for making work. You know, I mean like not feeling like, okay, I'm already bounced out. I can't, this is, this is not something that, A, not something that I'm interested, that I can do, but not something that I'm interested in doing yet. Um, and just be finding a justification for making work and, and getting it out there and, and seeing what happens. Um, but I think maybe I, I, as you keep going, I think it's maybe a mistake to try to find stability in the way you make work early on because it's just going to impose itself later. Um, at least it has for me. I don't, you know, now I maybe have to push back against some, maybe working on a project for four years kind of imposes this stability that I hope I can work myself out, out of. But I mean, it's just a constant process. But I do think finding, finding justification for making work and just acknowledging that even, I, I guess I've always like, there's always been artists like, you know, I'll look at like William Blake and I'll be like, wow, that's great. But you know, I don't have to be, I don't have to make work like that. <laughs> Hopefully that would be too, that would be impossible. So I, I have so many influences of artists, um, but I never, they're never really stylistic influences. They're, they're more just successful expression. That's the influence, you know? And I, whenever, you know, I, I feel in some kind of way competitive, hopefully in a good way of like, I'll see some beautiful music performed on TV. I'm not a musician, but I'd like to express myself as successfully as whatever performance I just saw, you know? Hey, uh, so you wear a lot of hats uh, through running Domino, your own art practice, your teaching. You've got an Inez Estrada hat. <laughs> yes. Um, can you talk about maybe the connection between those things, how they inform each other, or how like, mostly how work comes into your art? Yeah, I, I run this uh, small company called Domino Books, and it distributes self-published work, and I, um, it's, I spend a lot of time on it. And it's, I, I haven't talked about it that much this week, um, but I, um, I, I think anyone who's an artist in any degree, there's always institutions you wished ex existed. There's always things that you wished existed for you as an artist, and um, especially for, you know, more freaky work, there's less and less of the, I think, 
you know, maybe one way I wanted to start this talk is about how I, I do think like um, the visual world that we're experiencing everywhere, just in terms of design and and um, just the way the visual world looks outside of nature, start, is starting to feel a little more deadening. I don't know. Maybe that's just me, or maybe everybody feels like that as time goes on, no matter what era they live in. But I do think that that, um, and I, I hope I I express it a little bit in this talk. Work made. Um, Artwork is very important to me, just in in being able to keep going and and getting getting some of the the whole point of life of of interacting with people. And I feel that um, self published people's work is is always it's there's always the reason to not do it. There's always reason for people to be like, well, there's just too there's too much obstruction in my life to to be able to do this stuff. And I and I feel that way. So if I I want to build and there's plenty of other people that do it. But I want to build as many institutions. There's always I always notice things lacking for what uh, that would be helpful for what I want to do, and I would like to spend some time building those things. If if just for myself and the people who make art that I care about, um, it has gotten to the point where it's taking maybe a little bit too. It's it's taking away from making the work. Um, but you know that's up to me to to figure out. It's to me they're really united. Actually, I should have spent more time talking about Domino because overall they're they're one thing. But um, Hey, this is a teaching question. So you, you mentioned a couple times about switching materials and how important that was. So I wonder when you are working with students, how do you get them, like what's, what's the dynamic between getting them to work longer with materials and kind of knowing how to work with them versus knowing when to like switching materials will be an important step in their development? I um well I I'm just so permissive with students. I, I try to, I teach a core illustration class and um, it's like for sophomores, and I, if, if you're going into this illustration program at Parsons, you have to take this class. It's one of the core classes. And I just, um, I try to make the assignments as general as possible. I try to discourage people from making digital art because I know it the least, and I have the least experience of working with it, so it's hard for me to provide feedback. But I try to put, no, I, to me, what these, what I want, I didn't go to art school, but I did go to school for writing, um, you know, for doing, for, for working with poetry and things like that. And what I wanted was time to make work. I, and I felt very motivated to, I, I liked some structure for assignments, I guess, but not really. So I, um, I, I think what, what I like is giving feedback with, with students about what they want to work on and then editing what they want to work on. That, that I feel like I can do. So I never direct them to use, I, I leave them to their own devices. You know, I really want them to, they have this like amazing amount of time and hopefully hopefully they'll continue to be able to have that amount of time to make artwork in the way they want to, but there's no guarantee. So I hope that they can, I'm, I'm also not so worried about students of that age coming up with a style because that's, that's another thing that's just gonna impose itself. So hopefully they're just making a lot of work and I try to get out of the way except for talking about the work because that would have been valuable to me. So, so yeah, I, they, I let them use whatever materials they want. And if they, sometimes if they work really well with a material and in the next assignment they're working with something else, I, I'm like, maybe, you know, try working with that again, but. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, your process is fascinating, the way that you draw first. I think that that's really cool. Excuse me, cool. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where the words come from and what that looks like with your improv process? I, I hopefully, like, I, what I hope to do is that they, they happen organically. You know, I hope that the, the writing and drawing are a unity. And I, I, sometimes the drawing will suggest a phrase. I mean, there are, there's, there's always, sometimes a genesis, genesis of a story will begin with a phrase and wanting to do justice to that phrase or, or a series of thoughts. And, you know, I'll make notes of those. But I do sometimes, I mean, in terms of drawing, I can definitely say sitting down to make drawings is the only thing that leads to more drawings. I can't like conceive of um, I can't conceive of visual ideas um, separate from making work. When I'm not making work, that's when I like have no. It's so hard to come back because uh, if if I'm not in the phase of working every day, I, I don't have any I don't have any you know um, fuel to to do anything. Just I have no ideas. Um, with with the writing parts, things will occur to me, um, and I think like anyone, I'll like make notes, maybe send myself an email if I'm walking around or something that'll work. But that never ends up working out. 
it, that never ends up like I feel like oh I have to yeah I used to carry around a notebook and take down notes of what I thought would make for a good story but that has never worked for me and it's always the process of the drawings hopefully leading to some inevitable kind of set of circumstances where phrases come up or if I'm really doing my job uh, the way that I like to do it that I'm drawing I'm working with these characters so much and they are they're you know I don't believe that all the, your characters Oh, they surprised me, or something like that. But uh, they, you know, that you're working with the drawings, and they start they start talking naturally, and, and the sequence of events matter to you as much as as the drawings themselves. Hi, um, you've talked really. Sorry, I'm right here. Yeah. Hey, hi. Um, you've talked really extensively about the kind of importance of self-publishing and kind of the impact, in particular, that like zines had on your art development. And I was wondering. Um, what thoughts you had on kind of like the rising prevalence of um, like cartoons and comics that are um, presented or like I guess distributed through social media or like web comics or um, like websites? You mean like like people serializing their stories on Instagram? Yeah, or just even like creating um, non serialized comics um, and just kind of posting them on Instagram yeah. instead of like producing them physically. I mean, to me, what's interesting about people who put their work on Instagram, it's like first, you know in a, a conservative way, I'm like, oh yeah, people are formatting their work for Instagram. This is so stupid, you know, like everybody's gonna do this now and they're like feeding this horrible, you know, uh, social media engine. But, you know, some of my favorite comics and I think the most, the ones with the, like early newspaper comics like Little Orphan Annie or Popeye, you know, they're just four panels, but over time if you, you know, if you get all the collections, it's like an amazing, thousands of pages work of art and those were formatted for you know those were just I think the success of that format for cartooning is proven out by Instagram uh, in in a way because you know newspapers fall away and alt weeklies you know you used to have like the alt weeklies used to have these some of my favorite cartoonists like Ben Catcher they would they would publish their work in alt weeklies and it would be two tiers of panels instead of just one and would come out every week and there was so much amazing work done in that way and Instagram kind of just you know, I mean, I guess the internet destroyed all those things and then it gives us an avenue back in to serializing those things for an audience. So, I mean, it still makes me mad, but it's the, the work being made in that way. It makes sense to me. And people, I, I do think, um, I've worked with publishers and this book, Mescan, the Gola Casual was with a small publisher and Mescan and Mezzo is self-published. And I, I do think that um, the audience for Strange Comics is small enough that I don't know if it's totally justified by a small publisher. I mean, it's good to, they can get your, your book in a museum. But in terms of supporting yourself, I think it can be a good thing to self-publish. Um, and I, I like putting things in the mail and sending it to people. Um, so I do think, I think artists should do that. I think they should give it a try. Um, but I do, yeah, and then like if you, I feel like if you build up an audience for your work, maybe you do build up an audience for your work on serializing your work on Instagram. I, there's artists I know who have worked with publishers and then really use social media and they serialize their work. And when their book's ready, they say, go to the link in bio and they sell a lot of their work. So I think Instagram can be helpful with that and, and self-distribution. But I don't think, I don't think it's, I don't think Instagram's gonna, you know, like, Prince said this thing that I hope is true, where he's like, oh, the internet's a fad, it's not gonna last. He said that, I don't know, 13 years ago, but I, I think it might about to be true. I hope. I mean, it's just so, we're so saturated with it that, so I just don't wanna rely on Instagram, I don't wanna rely on Patreon or any of these things. They, everyone uses them and I've used them to some extent, but they, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, they are really evil and I, if, if they work for art, great, but I also don't wanna, I don't believe in them, you know? Cool, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I was, I read both of your books last semester when they first arrived. And um, so I, I, I can't say that I have total clarity on the characters. Um, but I was just really bowled over by the, the, the way that it made language seem completely impossible that that it was um, the the futility of communication because it'll never quite say what yeah. is, you're trying to say and that this that how well that comported with the gestures of the figures and 
a lot of the way in which what you described is kind of nonlinear pre presentation of the characters, how the characters would morph, um, uh, was relatively new for me. Um, uh, so when I'm reading it, I'm, I immediately noticed it as a visual artist, but I, it confused me a little bit at the beginning. But then I came to really love it because it, it felt like it was actually conveying a lot more than the language. So my question is, I'm sure there's not a specific order, but like it must be crazy to try to get the the language to to work with the image, because I can imagine you getting an image that you just are like that is it, and then the language is driving you crazy. You're like, no, that doesn't fit for that. And yeah, I think that's you, how do you resolve those? Is that a common problem for you? I hopefully I'll resolve it before I die, you know? I think it's like it goes into every, I mean, I think it's like always, yeah, it's always there. I mean, I really, I, I think I've uh, said in this talk that um, I hope that it's like a natural synthesis, um, but I really struggle with it. I mean, I want it to be, I mean, that's the thing, like with the cartoon integrity idea, it's like, yeah, like a good, you know, um, what's a good example? Uh, a good little Lulu comic, it's like, yeah, they sync up, you know? I understand. Or, or like Nancy is like perfect, you know? It's just like the words are so inevitable. With the, It's like everything is just like, it's like a diagram, but the most beautiful diagram you've ever seen. And so that's like a, that's like a high level version of it. I don't, um, I'd like to do my own version of that. I don't think I'm there, but I do, I do want it to be, does, I mean, am I answering, is, is that is that basically what you're answering, like having a synthesis yeah, of, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, that's what I aspire to do, but I mean, it's, um, yeah, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm there yet, but I hope that there's elements of it. Um, I mean, commu I think communication is very hard. Um, I, I have a hard time just in general communicating, and um, I think it's, uh, I, it's hard, it's hard for, I guess like when I'm, watching a normal movie or reading popular fiction, everybody's communicating very well and it seems insane to me. I mean, but I, I'm not saying like, oh, it's bullshit, but I mean, it's like, like with Brisson's movies, people, like I watched them with friends and everybody was like, why are the characters speaking so stilted? Like, why is everybody talking so weird? And I'm like, no, this is like the only realistic movie because everybody's like, oh, it's all their tics and they, no one can really express themselves correctly. But, and it's not like they're, it's not like, having a hard time expressing yourself is, means you're some kind of introvert. I think like nor, normal people can't really express themselves that well. So I think that's, I'm trying to be a little honest with the work that way. One or two more questions. Anybody? Um, I'm wondering about the use of, um, as we were going through that slideshow and we were seeing your work, um, the use of doubling or like multiplying um, figures and if that's something that's sort of throughout all of your work and, and why it shows up or if it's more in this in this piece. I, I really started doing it with this. I mean, it's that's, that, that's a good question because it doesn't really sync up with a lot of the stuff I've been talking about. I do... I just liked how it looked visually. And I think there's enough justification for some of the reasons I do it. Um, it makes, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like too much of a step outside of what I'm trying to get at to, to have some of this repetition. Uh, but I do like how it, I, I, I like doing, it's, it's another thing where it's like, I need to, I need to have some motivation to sit down and, and do this stuff that's just for me. Um, and that is one of the things. And I, you know, if it was so, to me, if I felt like it, mess things up so bad that it's making a different point with the work than I wanted to make, I'd, I'd hopefully rein myself in. But yeah, I really enjoy doing it. It's, it, it makes for more of a puzzle of a drawing and more problems to solve, which is, I, I like doing that, so. Oh, there's someone back there. This slide was actually something that I was thinking about the, the drab world very specifically. And I guess I wanted to ask you um, how much your how much of your written work in your comics is your opinion and how much of it is reflective of a greater like cultural voice or cultural 
um, despair or nihilism or something like that. I, that's, yeah, I, um, yeah, again, it's like, it's part of it is, is just things that people have said to me that, I, you know, I, I find compelling and, you know, mean something to me. So some of it is other people's opinions. This part about the drab world or like ha having a hard time, um, you know, walking around and sometimes just feeling like you have no connect, you know, that, yeah, that you're just, you're stuck with just the kind of, the way things, the way things are. I mean, yeah, that's def definitely something I struggle with. Um, I hope it's not, you know, on good days, I'm like, well, that's not the totality of how I feel. But it's definitely a big part. I mean, you know, I, and I don't think it's just, I don't think it's just uh, chance. I don't think it's just like, oh, I have these kind of feelings about the world because there's internal forces inside. You know, I mean, I, I do think the, I, I, don't, I don't know how to make political work, but I do think, you know, you walk around and you see vast, you know, levels of despair every day. I, you know, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to find a way to, to justify that in any way to yourself and wake up and, you know, I mean, and then, you know, other things too, just, just your own life. It's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to confront head on. Um, and I think everybody every day tries to deal with it in their own way. But yeah, this passage is definitely, you know, if, if with nothing else, yeah, it's hard. I, I find it hard to just, um, to look at things dead on a lot of the time. But this is very nice, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Books are for sale. Austin is happy to sign yours if you want to buy one or if you already own one. Or if you just need to say hi. And I have a giveaway one, too. Uh, Who's giving one that. away? If someone asks nicely. Someone want to raise a hand? Quick! Well, <laughs> well, first come, first serve. I thank you all so much. Again, thank you, especially to the students who but you know, walking me into these classes, it was it was really incredible, and I'm going to run over to the uh, table there now. Thank you so much.